Open your Bibles this evening to Amos chapter 7. That's Amos chapter 7. We're going to look at verses, or read verses 1 through 6, but we're only planning on looking at verses 1 through 3 this evening. Amos chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We're moving on from the prophet Joel. And while the, the dating and authorship of the, the book of Joel is somewhat in question, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that dating the book of Joel and actually even knowing who wrote it is, is difficult. Uh, you know, we have to kind of settle on uh, a place where we think it belongs. The book of Amos is completely different. The, the author, his, his place, his title, what time, the context is given to us very clearly in the first verse of the book. Uh, Amos chapter 1, verse 1 reads, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he, saw which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Josiah, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. This gives us a very specific time for the writing of Amos. It's, it's during the same time that Isaiah walked the earth. Even at this time, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, though they are separate nations, are still world powers. They're still powerful nations with powerful armies. Israel has withstood attack after attack from the Assyrians and beaten them off. And, and, uh, and again, as a successful nation, there's several things we learn about the prophet here at the beginning of the book. The prophet is a shepherd, and it's a poetic truth, a poetic reality as we get to later, thinking of the shepherd intercessor. And that's the name of the sermon this night, the shepherd intercessor. He preaches in Israel. He's not in Judah. As, as Isaiah, who spent most of his time in and around Jerusalem and prophesied to the kings of Judah, Amos is a member of, or, a, or a citizen of the country of Israel, the northern tribes. And Israel's sins are well known. It is a commonly known fact that if you list all of the kings of Israel and just say, and just put next to them, did wickedly, did wickedly, did wickedly, you would get 98% on the test. All of the kings of Israel turned away from God. There was one king, Jehu, who put away the prophets of Baal and put away the idols of Baal and ended many of the evils and worships that were going on. But even him, even the best king that Israel saw, still clung to the golden calves instead of worshiping the Lord as he had prescribed. Some of the sins of Israel are those golden calves. Again, from the very uh, onset of the nation as Jeroboam the first, the, the the uh, first king of Israel set up golden calves because he was afraid that if anybody would go to Jerusalem to keep the Lord's Sabbaths and feasts, they would turn away and leave Israel and he would lose power. So instead of, uh, instead of worshiping God as God has designed, Jeroboam, the first king of Israel, set up these golden calves and Israel worshiped there. And we know of the wickednesses of Baal, worship, especially among uh, well-known kings like Ahab and his wife Jezebel. We know of the stories of, the, of Mount Carmel and the uh, intervention that the Lord brings. And if we read the stories of Israel, we find abomination after abomination. We find Moloch worship. And we find that a complete neglecting of God's feasts and God's Sabbaths. And what does Amos do in this scenario? And what's, there, there's a standard pattern. There's, a, there's a, a theme that runs throughout Scripture, and it's always repentance. In the context of the first six chapters, we're going to pick up in Amos chapter 7. So to give us some context, Amos is this prophet. He's this shepherd, and, and he hears from the Lord concerning Israel. And what does the Lord have to say? The Lord brings a what we call an oracle of woe, condemnation. And right at the beginning, it seems like the oracle is against the lands around Israel. Chapter 1, the oracle seems to be dedicated to Moab and Edom and Tyre, the Assyrians. And the Lord pronounces judgment on the wickedness of these lands. But by the time you get to chapter 2, chapters 2 through 4, the entire focus is the wickedness that God sees within Israel. 
God speaks of the sins, the, the ones we've just covered, the golden calves, the Moloch worship, the abomination, the neglecting of what he has commanded. And then we reach chapter 5 of, of Amos, and there is the call to repentance. This is the theme that we see throughout the Minor Prophets, throughout Scripture, as the, the Lord over and over again through his prophets calls for the repentance of his people. We see how it's central to Scripture. When we think about repentance, we were just in Joel. Joel chapter 2, we talked about where the Lord commanded Israel to rend its heart and not its garments, to return to the Lord, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. You'll see the, the continuation of this theme from Joel chapter 2 as we continue down in Micah. Along the, the, the same timeline, the same events that are happening around the world is another well-known prophet named Jonah. We remember Jonah's message was repentance. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Notice again the theme of repentance turning to God, turning away from evil, and God relenting of disaster. Again, a theme that we will find here in chapter 7 of Amos this evening. Jeremiah was another prophet just a few years after the life of Amos. He was a pre-exilic prophet. Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. We've been through Lamentations in Jeremiah. We see in the words of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verse 8, he, the Lord says, And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I have intended to do to it. Notice we have this, these words from Joel of repentance that come before Amos is, is walking on the, is, and, and preaching and teaching. During the, concurrently, during the life of Amos, we have Jonah preaching repentance to Nineveh. We have Amos preaching repentance to Israel. We have Isaiah preaching repentance to Judah. And then even as the nation itself, the nations are going into exile. Israel's already gone off into exile and Judah's being carried away in the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is preaching repentance. If you will turn, I will relent, the Lord says. God is loud, consistent, and persistent in calling Israel to repentance. You think about the miracles that he does along the way. Before Amos, there was Elijah. And I, we've already mentioned Mount Carmel, the, the miracle of the, the fire coming down from heaven and, and consuming the offering before everybody. We see a moment of revival as the nation of Israel picks up swords with Elijah and 400 prophets of Baal are put to death. But the very next day, the very next week, they are back worshiping Baal. The Lord has spoken through His prophets. The Lord has called through signs and miracles to His people, and they are still unrepentant. Now we pick up in Amos chapter 7, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, where it is written, This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And when they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. It devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. And then I said, O oh Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. May God bless the reading of his holy, infallible, and sufficient word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let us not be viewers. Let us not only be hearers this evening of your word when we contemplate the power of your wrath, the strength of your destruction, your means and ends destroying from the end. Let us be warned. Let us 
have the same response as Amos and run and say, Lord God, please forgive. You are merciful. You are kind. Let us see in the words of the intercessory shepherd, in the words of Amos, a, a archetype, a, a picture, a, a, a shadow of our Christ, the one true shepherd who intercedes for all of his flock. Lord, let us have a greater knowledge of Christ this evening so that we may be strengthened to the tasks that you have for us, that we may be emboldened to speak against the evils of this world, and we may proclaim the righteousness that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this and we ask this in his name and for his glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Think about God's patience here. He's setting the stage, getting our minds into the context of the Scripture. The evils that have been perpetuated by the people of Israel, the, again, golden calves, the Baal worship, the Moloch worship, the complete ignoring of God's Sabbaths for the land, the repeated calls, even with miracles for repentance, and the Lord still relents at the prayer of this prophet. Calvin comments here and says, On these, uh, Amos shows in this chapter that God had already deferred punishment, which had yet determined, which he had yet determined to inflict on the people. And thus he reminds the Israelites of their perseverance inasmuch as they had abused the forbearance of God and repented not after a long lapse of time. But the Lord had suspended His judgment for this end, listen carefully, that they might be willing to turn to the right way, as He commonly allures men with His kindness, provided that they are teachable. And that is the question this evening. As we read in Amos, we read of a people that were unteachable, that received the judgment of God and... and we will, ask, we will, by necessity, need to ask ourselves, are we teachable? Will we repent when we hear the call of the Lord for repentance? Let's take a look at verse 1. Amos chapter 7, verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, He was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowing. We must not run past the beginning sentence here. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord speaks. The Lord reveals Himself to Amos. The Lord speaks and says, This is what is happening, Amos. Look around you. Do you see the locusts? I formed them. And what is the purpose? What is the reason? Why does God show? He has said elsewhere in His Word that He reached out His hand all day long to a rebellious people. The Lord shows uh, the wickedness of man and the righteousness of His judgments and the greatness of His mercy. The Lord God showed me, Amos said. As He speaks to the people of Israel, He speaks with the authority of God and says, This is what the Lord hath said. And what does the Lord say? I formed. The Lord showed me that He was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. I think it's Take the picture here, the word that's being used in Hebrew is yesar. It's the same word that Isaiah uses in chapter 45, verse 7, where Isaiah says of the Lord, I form the light and create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. The Lord says, I am forming these locusts. And this is the creation process. The Lord is saying, I am raising this up. I'm bringing them out of the land. The word there is, is for creation. It's for, it's for the forming of the, the swarms, of the judgment. Take the bigger picture as we look at it. The Lord says, I formed these locusts. I formed this plan. I've brought my judgment here. And when does God bring His judgment? The, the, after the king's mowings. The picture here the understand what's going on in the Mediterranean in the, the area where this happened we have a subtropical environment we have two harvests potentially a year and that's how the system would work the first harvest the first fruits of the land would be the kings 
mowing, the king's gift to the king. And the people would then live on what was left over. The uh, commentator, or the, the, the Bible commentary that R.C. Sproul wrote, the Reformation Study Bible, R.C. Sproul writes, the latter growth, or the king's mowings. This verse seems to indicate that the first crop was the king's crop, representing the king's share, while the farmer and his family depended on the second harvest for survival. The destruction of this second crop by locusts places the population at risk of starvation. Notice what the Lord is saying here. I am cutting off from the land the sustenance that you need. I am bringing this destruction at the point where the growth is for what you need. Why? I am the Lord. I create light. I create darkness. I make well-being. I create calamity. And as we've seen in the first six chapters of this verse or book, the Lord has already listed all of the evils that He is, that he is bringing into judgment. The first harvest goes to the king, the second to the people, and he raises up the locust just at the time when it would threaten them. Just to put it in the mind of us Iowans, just imagine a Iowa where it didn't freeze in the winter. You could grow food all winter long. How, how, how much growth would there be? And the temptation that comes with that. Remember the Lord's condemnation of not keeping His Sabbaths. Israel had ignored his commandments. Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 4, the Lord spoke from Moses on Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into that land that I give you, they're there, they're in that land. The Lord says, When you come into that land, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For, the, for six years you shall sow your fields, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. Not only are they, not only are the Israelites ignoring God's Sabbaths, they're harvesting the land twice a year. They're growing more and more and more for the purpose of self-preservation. Why does that matter? Right? That's why we grow food, right? We, we, we plant the seeds so we can eat the crops. This is why the Sabbath is important. The Lord is reminding them, and that's the purpose of this vision, that's the purpose of this curse of the locusts, to remind them that they have no power to save themselves. They have no chance to stand against the wrath of God. They must rely on His provision alone. The Lord raises up locusts to cut off that provision because they had broken His commandments. And the latter growth, the support they required was not a harvest. The starvation they wished to avoid was not found in the field, but in the relenting of God's eternal wrath. This is why Amos, as we read in verses 2 and 3, his response to this vision is, Oh God, please forgive. Amos 7, verses 2 through 3. The author writes, When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, Oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. There's an argument among theologians about how to interpret that first statement. When they had finished eating the grass of the land. Some say that this is within the vision that they had finished eating the grass of the land. And others say, no, there was really a plague of locusts that had eaten the grass of the, grass of the land. And this is what brought the people to inquire of the prophet Amos. What is the Lord doing? Calvin gives us a little insight here as he writes and says, Now by locust, I understand this to be a moderate kind of punishment. We have seen elsewhere, in Joel chapter 1, that the country had been nearly consumed by locusts and, like, uh, and the like pests. But this is, in this place, the prophet speaks metaphorically, designating hostile invasions which had not immediately laid waste to the whole country, but in some measure desolated it. 
Calvin says, the best way to understand this, the best way to think about this, is that there were locusts around, and they could have laid waste to everything, but they didn't. And the Lord spoke through the prophet Amos and said, they did not lay waste to everything because I relented in my judgment. Notice there that, that Calvin calls it a moderate punishment. You think about famine and starvation as a moderate punishment, and uh, famine and starvation seem don't seem very moderate until you read the next three visions that Amos has. There's, in this section of Scripture, there are three major visions. Verses, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, chapter 7, verses 4 through 9, and chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And this really is the smallest judgment. The other judgments come with fire and destruction. The final oracle of woe, the final judgment in chapter 8 is the destruction of the land. This brings us to the heart of the matter, the, the thing we must consider. This is the moderate punishment. This is the smallest judgment of the oracles that are being laid out here. And who can stand against this smallest drop of God's wrath? Who can stand, as the prophet says, when he is so small? The prophet Amos says, Lord, please forgive how can Jacob stand? He is so small. Remember that Israel at this time is a mighty nation, a world power. Under the reign of Jeroboam and uh, Uzziah, the armies of Israel are over a million men in both Judah and Israel. There's strength to be found. And the prophet doesn't look at the nation and say, look how strong this nation is. They can handle this. The prophet sees the smallest drop of God's wrath, and his response is, we are small. The mighty nation is small. God's wrath, God's holiness is a consuming fire, and we are grass. There's nothing that can stop his judgments. To put our minds around the subject, we'd have more of a chance of stopping the earth flying through space than stopping God's judgment. It is that set in motion. It cannot be moved. Only his heart, only his hand moves as his, at his will. And notice how Amos responds. He doesn't look to the people and say, Hey, God showed me we're about to have a bunch of bugs, so let's make some bug spray. We'll be just fine. We can handle this. No, his response is, Lord, this is but a drop of your wrath, and we are small. Lord, please forgive. Please relent. And again, we come to the poetic nature of the ministry. The way God writes the story of Christ into the events of history. As we've seen all along, in every place, in every time, in every purpose, it is to show the greatness and sufficiency of Christ's salvation. We have a shepherd. The actual word in the first chapter of Amos there, in chapter 1, is sheep breeder. Amos is one that works with sheep. Notice he's not a famous prophet. He's not a son of the prophets. You, you know the stories from 2 Kings as uh, Elijah and, and Elisha travel with the sons of the prophets. This is where people looked in the stories of Elisha and Elijah. All the kings had many prophets surrounding them, advising them, often lying to them. This man is just a shepherd. He's a one called from among the sheep. A very fitting image as the Lord has called shepherds to protect His people before and lead His people before in David and will call the one shepherd later to atone rightly for their work. Notice this shepherd intercedes. Lord, relent. Lord, forgive. Lord, we are small. We have no strength to stand up against your wrath. He appeals to God's mercy. And in this we see God's merciful nature. God's righteous judgments brought against the evils that are going on in the nation are withheld by the intercession of this lowly shepherd. What do we see? What do we understand what context do we have? We fast forward to the New Testament in Acts chapter 17 and the 
apostle speaking to the Areopagus, to all the wise men of the world around him. And he says, look, in old times God passed over. God relented his judgment. But now he commands all, everyone, everyone everywhere to repent. The locusts were turned away and the destruction was not final. But the wrath of God must be satisfied. People are warned. Amos says, you see these locusts and they've eaten a lot of the land, but we have enough to survive. And we have enough to survive because the Lord's judgment has turned away. The darkness that he has formed, he has put away himself. He formed locusts to eat all the land. And instead of allowing them to eat the land, he has used them as a reminder. A reminder of his benevolent care. Even though they had spurned him to his face. What was the words that Calvin used? As he wrote, he said, they had abused the forbearance of God. Time after time after time, the Lord had called to his people to repent, to turn from their wicked ways. The Lord had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to his people and continued to reach out to his people and their stiff-necked hearts resisted him. And the wrath of God must be satisfied. There must be justice met. So there is the question, who can stand against the wrath of God? Who can stand against the wrath of God? Who can, who can assuage this justice? Who can, who can provide the needed sacrifice when the people of God turn from Him every day? There is one. There is one that stood in the face of this wrath. And he was not a shepherd by trade, but he was the great shepherd by nature. You see the panorama that's laid out for us in Scripture. In every book, in every part, the people are called to repent. The revelation of sin, the necessity of salvation is shown over and over and over and over again. When Christ came, when Christ offered salvation through faith when repentance was the watchword of those who had come to faith in Christ. It isn't a new story. It goes back to the very beginning as the shepherd was set to drink the wrath of God on behalf of his people. He stood and he faced and he prayed and he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And then he walked and he was kissed and betrayed, taken and chained and beaten and scarred and hung on a tree. And in that moment and in that time, as he drinks down the cup of wrath and he drains it dry, he looks around him at those that are reviling him at those that are calling for his crucifixion, at the Roman soldiers that are following orders, and he says, Lord, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Lord, forgive them, because I have paid the debt. The justice is done. And then he breathes his last, and we hear his final exclamation of victory as he says, Teletestai. It is finished. It is done. The wrath is drunk to its dregs. Even the smallest drop of the wrath of God is an eternity. An eternity of eternities the great shepherd drank. An eternity of eternities for God's justice was done. And he said, it is finished. See, brothers and sisters, as we get close to wrapping up this evening, There is a reason for the words God showed me. There's a reason that Amos was showed this vision, and it is in love for his people. God's relenting has a purpose. My dear family in Christ, God showed this vision in love. God reminds us as we read the words of Amos that the smallest judgment that the smallest, the, the least judgment, a few bugs 
coming from the hand of the Lord in righteousness, are more than a mighty nation can withstand. Didn't matter how many armies Israel had. Didn't have, matter how strong the nation was. It didn't matter who their allies were, whether it was Judah or Egypt. Whoever they called on, the Lord could overthrow with simply the forming of his own insect army. The Lord reminds us that we're small and his judgments are bigger than us. He reminds us to cry like Amos, Lord, please forgive. And we must be careful here because it's easy to look back at the text of Scripture and go, well, I wasn't worshiping any golden calves or Baal or Moloch. I don't need to cry, Lord, forgive. What did I do? I'm the faithful Christian, right? I'm in church every single Sunday. I give of my tithe. I help the community. I do all of the right things, and very soon we start to sound like the Pharisee standing, Lord, I thank God that I'm not like other men. But it wasn't the Pharisee that went home righteous. It was the tax collector, the sinner who said, Lord, have mercy on me. God gives us this vision on purpose to, so that we might see that he will relent when we repent and see the greatness of our shepherd. Locusts. Bugs, insects, with them the Lord had the power to destroy the entire nation, to bring starvation, to bring famine. How much greater is his wrath against the sins of his people? As we'll see later on in verses through, 3 through Excuse me, 4 through 9, and when we get down into chapter 8, the destruction that God wreaks, the, the stench of death, the silence. You should go read it. Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. The picture of destruction and death that is poured out at the hand of the Lord for unrighteousness. And we see Him, our shepherd, who stands in between us and the wrath to come. So that there is no more wrath for God's people because it has already been drunk down. We see Him who is strong. And He used that strength for us. Don't we teach it in the children's song? Little ones to Him belong. They are weak. But He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Friends, we think of that as a children's song, but we are the little ones. We are the weak ones. The very, this very moment we stand, as the preacher Jonathan Edwards said, on the precipice of eternity. Only his gracious hand keeps us from falling. The death of our Savior is our life. He drunk the wrath of God. He walked up to the Lord and said, Jacob is small. Father, Israel is little. I will take their place. I will carry the weight of the wrath. I will bring justice so that you can be the just justifier. As we continue this after the Advent series, probably in the end of December or the beginning of the year, we'll continue to see the escalation in judgment. Again, the purpose of God in showing us these things is to show us the greatness of the salvation that we have in Christ. As we meditated in Lamentations and we saw the evil that was done to the people of Israel, the people of Judah by the Chaldeans. 
it was shared, it is written down for us so that we will come back and cry out to God. Oh Lord God, please forgive. I am little, I am weak, but my Savior is strong. We end this evening in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people would say, Amen.